And hello, everybody. Pastor Rob Ford from Elisha's Home and Ministries here. Just love my farmer's tan, don't you? I bet some of you are very, very uh, jealous of that. If you really want a farmer's tan, we'll uh, get you bucking some bales and riding on some tractors, and you'll get a good tan. But remember, it's a farmer's tan. Anyway, just waiting for the rest of you to come on board. I see Jawan and a few others are are uh, starting to watch. Good to see all of you. And uh, I just want to remind you that tomorrow night, Dr. Pegg will be speaking at 7 at Facebook Live. And Thursday, we have our normal men's Bible study. And on Friday night at 7, we have Facebook Live again. And, and I'll be speaking Friday night. And Pastor Tim will be speaking Sunday morning uh, at our church at 10 a.m. Facebook Live will be probably around 10.45, 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. I hope you've had a, a good week since last Tuesday when I met. It seems like my Tuesdays are always extremely uh, busy, I guess is the best word for it. Uh, so I just, I, I had a good cup of coffee. I'm hoping and praying that I won't yawn on you. I know how unprofessional that is. But uh, I just, it's nothing personal. It just, my day begins very early on a Tuesday morning and I'm excited to see what God has. So anyway, my last service I spoke on where was Jesus? And I had a lot of great comments on that and I do appreciate that. But that's the Holy Spirit moving in my life, showing me where Jesus was in those tough times. And today at the retirement center, um, I'm back at the retirement center I was, I've been there two or three, maybe four times now since uh, we went green, if you want to call it. And uh, I stand out halfway to the parking lot, and they're, they're under cover about 20, 30 feet away from me. And um, they sing along, and we sing some of the old worship hymns, and I love those. And the one I've actually spoke on before, it's called Standing on the Promises of God. And uh, if Mike, if you're watching, brother, uh, you're, the, you're one of those people that... Um, literally meant standing on God's word and when I first met met him man Mike you know he would he would stand on God's word he would literally and not trying to be sacrilegious or anything he said I'm gonna stand on God's word and and he would stand on the word of God he would physically stand on it to get his point across that we need to stand on God's word no matter what in that song it says standing on the promises of Christ my King if he's not your king, if he's not your savior, you can't stand on the promise. The promise is only acquired to you if you're a child of the king. It says, through eternal ages, let his praises ring. So from 2,000 years ago on, his, his praises will ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Chorus basically goes, standing on the promises of God, my savior. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. And the other verse says, Listen every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior. That's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? But we need to. As my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. There's so, in fact, I think there's another verse to that. But it just, it brought, it brought back a lot of memories. And today, it's funny. I spend about 30 minutes at the retirement community and I really enjoy the people. They they actually give me more than I think I give them. They're just so positive and they just enjoy having some kind of visitor, some kind of human interaction. And, and I've been going there probably 22, 23 years now and just getting to know the people. And I'm a volunteer. Uh, so I had, there's no, and it's not like I'm going to steal anybody's sheep. I just go there because I feel God wants me to go there. And I got my start in preaching at a retirement home for uh, missionaries and pastors and stuff. So it was, you know, it's just, I feel like I'm at home when I'm there. It was also the, that song, it was also one of the hymns we used to sing when I was in my little Methodist church as a boy. I told you, I didn't get saved until I was 19 or so, but I remember my parents um, basically telling me I had to go to church until I was 12. And we used to sing those old songs. And so I looked up, uh, you know, the composer of that, of the Standing on the Promises. And it's written by the late composer Russell Kelso. Russell Kelso Carter. Carter was an ordained minister who later became a medical doctor. He faced a personal crisis in his early years that caused him to search the Bible oh, for, for healing promises from God. 
He suffered from a heart condition, and he said that once he began to hold fast to the written word of God, his strength returned, and his heart was completely healed over the course of several months. You get a chance, look up the whole story. His name was Russell Kelsall Carter, and he wrote Standing on the Promises of God. So, you know, what's interesting is a lot of people will say, oh, that's just positive thinking. No, it's not. It's it's literally believing what God's Word says, believing it, receiving it, and confessing it. And, and actually knowing in your knower that God wants this, this, or that for you. Whether it's healing, whether it's deliverance, it doesn't matter. If you stand on the Word and you continue to confess the Word and believe in your heart, it things will change. Are you a promise keeper? I thought that was an interesting question. Are you a promise keeper? Do you sometimes keep a promise? Maybe when it's convenient you keep a promise? Or uh, maybe are you convicted when you don't keep a promise? Maybe you're not. I guess the... I, how can I say this? A lot of times we parents... We look back in our childhood, and when someone did not keep a promise, that made, I won't say a scar, but an impression. And so I came to a point as a father, and I'm not saying I'm perfect at this, but I hardly ever make a promise unless I'm 120% sure I can I can keep it. Most of the time you'll hear me say, you know what, If if it's possible, we will do that. And if I don't think it's possible, I'll just say, I don't think that's possible. I heard a preacher one time say, you know, a lot of Christians are good at lying. And I thought, what? What are you talking about? Christians are good at lying. And he said, you know, a lot of people don't know they're lying. And they are. What is a lie? A lie is when you specifically tell an untruth knowing it's an untruth. And, and he used the example. He said, how often, and he was talking to pastors, he said, Pastor, how often do people say, hey, I will see you in church Sunday morning when they know for sure they're going on vacation or they're going to be gone, they're going to the casino or wherever. But they know for sure they're not going to be there, but they tell the pastor just to kind of get the pastor off their back. Hey, I'll see you in church on Sunday. Wouldn't it be better just to be honest with a pastor? I've I've had so many people say, "Oh, uh, I'm gonna I'm not coming to church." I said, "Oh, that's good. You know, I'm, you know, the, I'm gonna be doing this and this." Well, you know, let the Lord lead you and so on. And you know, I always tell them it's important to you know, to assemble with the Lord's people. But you know, we all have reasons, and there's we all, there are good reasons sometimes. Um, I think what's interesting is is when someone will tell you, "Hey, I'm not going to church this Sunday. I have to do this, this, and this." Then I find out that they're at another church. It would be better for them to say, hey, I'm going to a church with my buddy. I, I respect that. I, I might not necessarily agree with it 100%, but I respect it. It's see when, But when a person purposely says, hey, pastor, uh, I'll see you tomorrow for sure, and they know better, that's they're lying. And I'll tell you what, that opens up a door for the devil to come in. So it's better to say, you know, I expect to be there tomorrow. If you really expect, or you can say, you know, I don't expect to be in church tomorrow. I really respect that. It's good to know, so I'm not concerned what happened to that person. So I, I just thought that was uh, interesting. Are you a promise keeper? Hmm. And, uh, well, I'll, I'll, let me go on. Uh, back in the 90s, I remembered the promise keepers. It was called promise keepers. And uh, it's actually starting to redefine and to build on their past and to redefine the future. They're actually starting the Promise Keepers movement back again. So the founder back in 1990 uh, was Coach Bill McCartney. Promise Keepers is one of the biggest movements of God in the history of the church. Focused on helping men live with integrity. Now I'm just talking to the men right now, but helping men to live with integrity Promise Keepers touched the lives of 7 million men through its national conferences. October the 4th of 1997, over a million of these men gathered at the National Mall of Washington, D.C. to take a stand for Christ. Wow. I know a couple of people that went to that and they loved it. It was so powerful. 
Yes, it's time for Christian men and all Christians to take a stand for Christ. See, often we don't. We don't keep our promise. We are becoming more and more like the world. So, do you keep your promises? Some of them, all of them, just a few of them? But well, one man did. And it's called Astor's Promise. I hope I pronounced that right. And I love this story. I've heard it once or twice before, but it really applies to tonight. The story goes, one stormy night, an elderly couple entered the lobby of a small hotel and asked for a room. The clerk said they were full and they would probably find so, find so were all the hotels in the whole town. He said, but I can't, I can't send a fine couple like you out in the rain. Would you be willing to sleep in my room? The couple hesitated, but the clerk insisted. The next morning when the man paid his bill, he said, you're the kind of man who should be managing the best hotel in the United States. Someday I'll build you one. The clerk smiled politely. See, let me give you a side note. I can't tell you how many people um, have told me to my face, "Hey, pastor, you know what? Uh, I'm going to win. I'm going to win this. I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm going to give to the church and all this." And I just tell them, "You know what? Just just let God lead. Don't don't make a promise that you might not be able to keep." So anyway, the story continues. I just thought it was interesting. So he said, I'll build you one. The clerk smiled politely. So he, he knew what possibilities were, one in a million probably. A few years later, the clerk received a letter containing an airplane ticket. The letter invited him to visit New York. When the clerk arrived, his host took him to the corner of Fifth Avenue and 34th Street, where stood a magnificent new building. That, explained the man, is the hotel I have built for you to manage. Wow. Wow. The man was William Waldorf Astor, and the hotel was the original Waldorf Astoria. Wow. I mean, to me, that's pretty cool. You know, that man remembered his promise that one day he would build a hotel for that man to manage. Author uh, Piola Hicks wrote, Promises are made to be kept. Whether or not we believe a promise depends largely upon the character, get this, the character and the track record of the person making it. <coughs> Excuse me. God has demonstrated his love and shown us his character through the person of Jesus. You know, it's funny because, um, or ironic I should say, that there are times, I'll get to know somebody over, you know, a couple years, six, eight, ten years, and then all of a sudden they'll meet up with a new person, maybe a new person will come to church, or they'll uh, a new person or somebody will be a little bit, uh, they'll take something wrong that I, I had preached or whatever, and they'll go to the person that has known me for six, eight, ten years. And all of a sudden, they, they're questioning my character when they don't even know this new person, but the new person questioned my character, so they started that. I thought, isn't that interesting? So a lot of times I'll just say, wait a minute, you've known me for how long? Have you ever seen any difference with me compared to that other person? And they said, ah. And, you know, I was blessed the other day when another, a friend of mine came up and said, you know, Pastor, I totally understand, you know, how you deal with things and why you deal with things. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate you. And so that means in my heart that they know me enough that I'm not perfect but I try very hard to be a promise keeper, to be a man of integrity. And even though there are times people will think you or me or another man or woman uh, might not be holding a strong character, they might not know the whole situation. And so I like what that lady said. She said, whether or not we believe a promise uh, depends largely upon the character and the track record of the person making it. And so I, I just tried telling people, what's my track record? You know, I, I'll do, I, I, I told one person, I told you this before, that uh, she gave me an extra $10 when I was at a checkout. And I, I said, ma'am, you gave me too much. Oh, no, I didn't. I said, no, you gave me $10 too much. And she looked and she realized she did. And she said, well, why, why wouldn't you just take the money and go? I said, because I'm not going to go to hell for stealing somebody else's money when I know personally that wasn't my money. Now, if it was an accident, that's a different story. But I mean, I'm not going to sin, open up a door for the devil to come in. So what's your track record? 
you know, for keeping a promise. And I know I might be, I'm probably getting under somebody's skin. I'm not trying to. I'm preaching at myself right now. What's my track record as a father, as a grandfather, as a parent, and so on, you know, and as a brother even. You know, I have, uh, I had two brothers and three sisters. Now I have one brother and two sisters. You know, and you know, so over the years, a few of them had passed away. And what am I sticking to the promises that I made to my family? Am I sticking to the promise that I made to my wife or my before I even married her? You know, that's I ask myself these things, and there are times I fall and I stumble and I mess up. But if you really know me, and I pers and I know that I made the mistake, I'll come to you and I'll, I'll apologize. So, what's your track record for keeping a promise? But see, the neat thing is, we all blow it, except for one person. Christ never blew it. His character, it says, God has demonstrated his love and shown us his character through the person Jesus. The hymn standing on the promise of God from, from my childhood always made, this is what this uh, lady, Piola Hicks, wrote. She said, the hymn standing on the promise of God from my childhood always made sense to me because I knew believed and trusted in the one who made the promise see i might fail you your mother or your father or grand they might fail you once in a while but god won't and and until you really learn to trust him your life as a christian is going to be really mixed up and helter skelter is the best way i can put it uh, god is trustworthy she goes on to say god is trust trustworthy and stands behind every promise that he makes Many people are in despair over their inability to find a meaningful job, for example. Others feel alone on college campuses where it's not always easy to make friends. In fact, a mother of a college student shared with her how her daughter's, how her daughter's struggling to find friends to eat with at dinner. This can feel like a very lonely, yet, yet she also is not alone because God is present. You know, a side note, I remember when uh, my one son started his Bible college and the the dorm specifically had people hang out with them until they started getting friends trying to make them feel like they were welcome and not loners it was it was really a neat a neat way of doing it she went on to say I live with hope each day knowing that God will never leave or forsake me brings great comfort to my heart and my life I have learned that whenever I experience something inconsistent with what I know to be true now that's interesting if you experience something that is inconsistent with what I know to, what you know to be true, she said, I can turn to God's promise and keep it in my heart. Keep God's promise in your heart. You do that and that will change your life. I don't care what's going on. You keep God's promises in your heart. You keep speaking them, believing them, and standing on them. God is present and help to help and strengthen us through life's uncertain paths and this she went on to finish she said i stand on god's promise to be with me through good times and hard times and so can you prayer helps us experience god's promises prayer gives us assurance that god wants to fulfill his promise to us it's a wonderful feeling to know that the creator of the universe wants to be near me all the time sometimes it takes a while for a promise from god to sink into our heart and into our mind therefore my prayer point my prayer point for you is to read and meditate upon the promise that Jesus made to us in Hebrews 13:5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Don't let see and you don't ever want to let go of that promise. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. The Bible is the word of God and it's powerful and it's life-changing. The promises of God start with 2 Timothy 3:16 when God tells us that all scriptures in the Bible are inspired by God. Now let me if you have it if you have your Bibles go to Second Timothy three sixteen. Now I'm going to read from the Amplified first, and then I'm going to read it from the Passion. Second Timothy three sixteen, all Scripture is God breathed, given by divine inspiration, and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error, and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will both publicly and privately, behaving honorably, and personal integrity and moral courage. Wow, that's a mouthful. Now in the Passion it says, Every scripture has been written by the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. It will empower you by its instructions and correction, 
giving you the strength to take the right direction and to lead you deeper into the path of godliness. Now that's a, that's a mouthful, but it's true. But too many people are not willing to meditate on the word and dig into it. The famous scripture that everybody knows, but nobody really follows, or be, I shouldn't say that. A lot of people don't believe it, it seems like, because they're not living it. It's the Jeremiah 29, 11 scripture. In the Amplified, it says, For I know the plans and thoughts I have for you, says the Lord, plans for peace and a well-being and not for disaster, to give you a future and to give you hope. But see, people are just, they're so hopeless right now. And people are just getting down and down and more anxious. When we need to be more and more into the Word, we need to be jumping into the Scriptures. Like Second Peter 1, Second Peter 1, starting in verse 2. Grace and peace, the special sense of spiritual well-being, be multiplied to you in the true intimate knowledge of God and of, our, and of Jesus our Lord. This is in the Amplified Bible. Verse 3, For his divine power has bestowed on us absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through a true and personal knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has bestowed on us his precious and his magnificent promises of inexpressible value. So that by them, those promises, you may escape from immoral freedom that is in the world because of the distributable desire and become sharers of the divine nature. Wow. Do you see that? The great promises. Magnificent promises, I'm sorry. Inexpressible value of those promises. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. Come to me in the Amplified Bible. All who are weary and heavily burdened by religious rituals that provide no peace. And I will give you rest, refreshing your souls with salvation. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Follow, following me as my disciple. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest, renewal, and blessed quiet for your souls. The passion, it's even better. Are you weary, carrying a heavy burden? Then come to me, I will refresh your life, for I am your oasis. Simply join your life with mine, learn my ways, and you'll discover that I am gentle, humble, easy to please. You will find refreshment and rest in me. But see, too many people... They they just they'll give up and they'll find refreshment in drugs, in alcohol, and sex, and all kinds and money even and stuff. And instead of turning to the Lord and just trusting in Him, the the great scripture that you hear me quoting all the time is Isaiah forty twenty nine to thirty one. It says He gives strength to the weary and to him who has no might He increases power. Even youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect and look for and hope in Him, will gain new strength and renew their power. Mm, I love that. They will lift up their wings and rise up close to God, like eagles rising toward the sun. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not get grow tired. So he, He's just showing you that it doesn't matter how old you are, if you rely and wait on Him... God will renew your strength. Philippians 4.19, one of my favorite scriptures again, in the Amplified, and my God will liberally supply. This is another promise. Fill unto full your every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The passion says, I am convinced that my God will fully satisfy every need you have. For I have seen the abundant, I love this, riches of glory, Revealed to me through the anointed one, Jesus Christ. Wow. Paul is speaking very firmly. He has seen that abundant riches of glory revealed by the anointing of Christ. Now, remember, he was not a follower or a disciple when Christ was here on this earth. It's not until he had an experience with Jesus did it completely change him. So people will say, well, I can never see Jesus. Well, Paul, did, look what happened to Paul. Jesus had already descended up to be with the Father. So Jesus came down and had some time with Paul. He can come down and have time with you. Romans eight thirty seven. 
in the NIV Bible says, No, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced. Now, that's a little, it's a little more of an uh, interesting way of putting it. I'll read the passion here in a minute. It's very simply put. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The passion says, yet even in the midst of all these things, in the midst of this virus, we triumph over them all, for God has made us to be more than conquerors. And he has demonstrated love is our good. And his demonstrated, I'm sorry, and his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. Verse 38, so now I live with confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I am convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through his through our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. So God's part is done. God's part is there. It's really up to us. God will not change. Romans 10.9 in the Amplified. Because if you acknowledge and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, recognizing his power, authority, and majesty as God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. People say, well, how do I know? Because he said it right there. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the passion says, and what is it? And what is God's living message? It is the revelation of faith for salvation, which is the message that we preach. For if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will experience salvation. Now let's turn that around. Those people that publicly disgrace Jesus and call him everything in the book, I guarantee the devil's going to try to take them out before they receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Because if they, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. You deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. So the devil, you know, people say, well, these people are working for the devil. Well, you know what? The devil's just using them and he'll take them out before they become Christians so we need to be praying. We need to be given the love of the Lord through this whole situation that we've been dealing with over the last six to eight months. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, that is his remarkable, overwhelming gift of grace to believers, is eternal life in Christ Jesus. There's just so many scriptures over and over and over again. Uh, Hebrews 1, 3. The Son, and this is one of my favorite verses. When Paul is speaking, he said, The Son is the radiance and only expression of the glory of our awesome God, reflecting God's Shekinah glory, the light being the brilliant light of the divine, and the exact representation and perfect imprint of his Father's essence, and upholding and maintaining all, propelling all things, the entire physical and spiritual universe. By his powerful word, Carrying the universe along to be to its pre to its predetermined goal, when he himself and no other had, by offering himself on the cross as a sacrifice for sin, accomplished purification from sins, established our freedom from guilt, he sat down, revealing his complete work at the right hand of the Majesty on high, revealing his divine authority. Remember, the Lord said that even blood, the blood of goats and sheep and doves, those really did not purify people from sin to get them into heaven. That didn't work. It had to be the perfect blood of the, the final lamb, which was Jesus Christ, because the only way somebody can get into heaven is to be perfect. And the blood of Jesus covers us so that we are perfect. Hebrews 6, 13 in the Passion. Now, when God made a promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater than himself, he swore an oath on his own integrity, on God's own integrity, to keep the promise as sure as God as God exists. So he said, have no doubt, I promise to bless you over and over and give you a son and multiply you without measure. So Abraham waited patiently and faith succeeded in seeing the promise fulfilled. It is the very, <laughs> I love this. 
It is very common for people to swear an oath by something greater than themselves, for the oath will confirm their statements and end all dispute. So in the same way, God wanted to end all doubt and confirm it even more forcibly to those who would inherit his promises. His purpose was unchangeable, so God added his vow to the promise. So it is, it, so it is impossible for God to lie, for we know that his promise and his vow will never change. And now we have run, it, run into his heart to hide ourselves in his faithfulness. And this is where we find his strength and comfort, for he empowers us to seize what he has already given to us and established ahead of time on the unshakable hope. Verse 19, we have this certain hope, like a strong, unbreakable anchor, holding our souls to God himself. Our anchor of hope is fastened to the mercy seat, which sits in the heavenly realm beyond the sacred threshold and where Jesus, our forerunner, has gone before us. He is now and forever our royal priest like Melchizedek. Wow. That's, so that was Hebrews 6. You want to study something? Study Hebrews 6. That will shake you. I mean, study it closely. Finally, I want to, I want to end with a, a true story that was told. It's called Mission Accomplished. It's about a promise keeper. It's a story of a friendship forged during one of the worst battles of World War II and the promise made almost 60 years earlier, a promise that was finally kept. Harold Huggins, a U.S. veteran of 10 major campaigns in World War II and the last survivor of his battalion, traveled halfway across the United States by train on one last mission in memory of his best buddy. I've had this on my mind for 57 years trying to locate his sister and loved ones out there in California, said Higgins. Part of him lives in me. Huggins from Albany, Illinois, and Mac McLean from Marysville, California, were best friends in the Army. They found they wound up together at Anzio Beach, Italy, the sense of one of the bloodiest battles of World War II. Mac told Harold that he didn't think he was going to make it out. Uh, make it out of their lives. So he gave Harold some mementos, a belt, some photos, and said, Give this to my sister. Tell her that I love her, Huggins recalls. You can even give her a kiss. Harold promised that if anything happened to Mac, he would do what was asked. One day later, Mac was killed in an artillery barrage. After the war, Harold looked for Mac's sister, but he never found her until Harold's daughter sent out emails to various veterans group inquiring about Mac's relatives. Some California veterans found Mac's sister, Grace, whose last name had changed because she had married. We have always hoped and prayed that we would meet somebody that would tell us about Mac, says Grace. On Thursday, August 2, 2001, at the place where his buddy's name is engraved in marble at the Veterans Memorial in Marysville, California, Harold Higgins kept that promise he made 57 years earlier. He met Mac's sister for the very first time, gave her the kiss that Mac asked Harold to deliver, and entrusted to her the mementos from his fallen friend. For an old soldier who wouldn't give up his search for a buddy's long-lost sister, there was a feeling of, mi of mission accomplished. Pastor David Sargent ended the story with this. And I love this. This is very well put. Friend, I want you to know about another friend who died for you. In fact, he voluntarily gave his life so that you and I might live, 1 Thessalonians 5.10. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend, John 15.13. Jesus demonstrated his, this great love and died for our sins so that you and I might live with him forever. God's mission of salvation was accomplished when Jesus paid the price for our sins, Ephesians 1.7. Through Jesus, we can have forgiveness and eternal life. We must accept his gift by believing in him, Acts 16, 30-31, turning from our sins in repentance, Acts 17, confessing before men, Romans 10, 9-10, and being baptized in his name for the forgiveness of our sins. Then if we will live faithfully to him, 1 John 1, 7, one day he will take us to live with him forever. That's powerful. Won't you allow his mission to be accomplished in you? Are you standing on that promise of eternal life? Maybe you're not. I'd like to just close in prayer 
I want to challenge you. Father God, I thank you and I praise you for the word of God that is truly yes and amen. Father, I ask you if there's anyone out there that never received Christ as Lord and Savior, that today is the day they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. And if there's anybody out there that really has problems keeping a promise, let them turn to the perfect promise keeper, which was Jesus, the exact representation of God himself. We thank you and praise you and ask that this word will go out and accomplish everything that it was meant to accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed day in the Lord. Dr. Pegg will see you tomorrow evening. God bless.